sure I wore some, uh, something similar to this when I went to the Ghostbusters party. And once I've understood which area is actually involved, I can then interrupt that. Very likely that this goes in a circuit, and I just need to then break that circuit. And it was relentless. It went on and on. Yeah. You know, I really felt like I was going to die at one stage. Chagas disease is a parasitic illness that is found mainly in the poor rural regions of Central and South America. And it is estimated that in excess of 10 million people are infected with the disease. I'm Dr. Joff Lacey and I'm in Bolivia to meet a woman who may just have found a solution to this devastating disease. Chagas disease is caused by the parasite Trypanosoma cruzi, which is carried by the triatamine bug known locally as vinchucas. When an infected vinchuca bites someone, it leaves behind infected feces. Scratching the bite rubs the infected feces into the wound. Once in the body, the parasites multiply and spread. The acute phase of Chagas lasts approximately two months, causing mild symptoms. It then goes into remission, and it can be decades later before the chronic stage begins where the parasites attack the heart and digestive organs, which can cause intestinal and cardiac disorders. Progressive destruction of the heart muscle can lead to heart failure and sudden death. There is no vaccine. Hola, Abraham. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Abraham Hemiel is an expert on the deadly vinchuca insect. Generalmente, la vinchuca se esconde en los agujeros de las paredes. Abraham assures me that at this time of day we won't be bitten. Tiene más actividad durante la noche. En el día permanece oculta en, en las grietas, pero en la noche sale para alimentarse y generalmente, como vemos acá, aquí duermen las personas. Oye, aquí. That's a vinchuca. Sí, esta es una vinchuca. He's big, eh? Sí. Si tú gustas, yo te ofrezco para que lo captures. So I just take and put. Sí, yeah. sí, al vaso. Click, listo. Oh. Ya está. Abraham, how, how many vinchucas do you think are in this house then? En mi experiencia, yo he encontrado en algunas viviendas, casi en algunas ocasiones, más de mil vinchucas. 1,000 vinchucas. Yeah. Oh, my word. The pain and suffering caused by infection has a devastating impact on communities like Urunditi. Of the 250 people that live there, Abram estimates that up to 80% have Chagas. Ulita, hola. What has been the impact of Chagas disease on your life and your family's life? Trabaja, pero cansa. Do you have Chagas disease yourself? De repente tengo. Mi hermana, pues, mi hermana. It's Chagas. I got it somewhere. <laughs> Mi marido igual. De repente por ahí, pues, pero no sé. For the past 15 years, Dr. Pilar Mateo has been working in Bolivia using an insecticidal paint to rid its infected communities of the Vinchuca insect. Tell me about Innisfly. This is the paint you have developed to combat Chagas disease. Look like a paint, but yeah. it's more sophisticated. It's a, a new technology. It's a biopolymeric microcapsulation. In other words, the new paint is an advance on previous insecticidal paints because the insecticides are embedded within microcapsules, which slowly release them over two to four years. Containing the insecticides like this means that the concentration of chemicals can be lower and that several different pesticides, which don't work if they are mixed together, can be used. OK, so do I have to dress up like that? Yes. OK, well, let's do it then. There's, there's nothing I'd like to do more than put an overall on in 35 degree heat. Which color? This color? Blue? Azul? Celeste? Nice. 
Do you want to spray? Yeah, I'd love to spray. I'm sure I wore some of that, something similar to this when I went to a Ghostbusters party. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then just... Uh... OK? Currently, each home costs approximately 200 US dollars to paint, with the financial support coming from various organizations and private donors. In the last 15 years, Pilar and her team have treated 6,000 homes in 93 communities across the region, which are home to 24,000 individuals. Incredibly, the number of new cases of Chagas disease in these communities has dropped to almost zero. This is because one insect bites you. Yeah. The more important is the, the insect don't bite you. Yeah. This is the This is, this is yeah. the best vaccine the, to, to, to vaccine the, the house, not the people. With the inside and outside painted, the house will be clear of the insects within 24 hours. Following its success fighting Chagas disease, the paint is now being used to combat dengue fever and malaria in communities in Ghana. Hola. <laughs> Barbarita lives in one of the first villages that Pilar treated in Bolivia. Barbarita, can you uh, describe to me what your house was like before uh, the painting was done? Era la casa de tierra que no tenía una obra fina, no tenía pintura, la pared sin revoque, lleno de huecos. So were there lots of vinchuca in your house? Sí, le podíamos ver, pero nosotros ignorábamos lo que causaba el mal de Chagas. Ella es mi nieta. Las otras dos son mi hija. And they're Chagas free. Gracias a Dios y gracias a la doctora, las pinturas no tienen. Dr. Charles Drew's pioneering research into discovering a method for long-term storage of blood plasma during World War II not only saved the lives of thousands of servicemen and civilians, but paved the way for blood banks now in place across the world. In the late 1930s, the Washington-born African-American developed a method for safely separating and preserving the liquid parts of the blood, known as plasma, from the blood cells, as part of his doctoral studies. Before this, blood could only be stored for up to two days, but plasma could be stored for up to a week in refrigerators at blood bank sites. Plasma can be transferred to and from anyone, whereas successful blood transfusions depend on blood groups. This blood substitute helps replace fluids and treat shock. With war raging in Europe and blood stocks falling desperately low, Dr. Drew was appointed to lead a special medical effort known as the Blood for Britain Project, a scheme to transport blood and plasma across the Atlantic to Great Britain. He and his team oversaw the collecting of contamination-free blood from several New York hospitals, using centrifuging and sedimentation to separate blood plasma from cells. When the program ended in 1941, more than 5,000 liters of plasma had been shipped to England. Later that year, Dr. Drew headed the development of a blood bank for US military personnel, but left after becoming frustrated with the military's request for segregating blood donated by African Americans. He returned to his work as a surgeon and professor, but continued to develop new ways of collecting and storing blood, including setting up blood mobiles used by the Red Cross. Ironically, the Red Cross initially excluded African Americans from donating blood, a policy Dr. Drew openly criticized. At the time of his death, Following a car crash in the 1950s, he was known as the father of the blood bank, and today, around 92 million units of blood are collected globally each year. Millions of people around the world suffer from irregular heartbeats. This can affect the amount of blood the heart can pump around the body, leading to dizziness, shortness of breath, and in the worst cases, heart attacks or strokes. One of the main causes is when the heart's electrical system goes wrong. I'm Anya Sitharam and I'm in London to find out how advanced medical technology is helping treat the condition. A healthy heart is controlled by electrical impulses which originate from the heart's pacemaker, the sinoatrial node, and travel along pathways through the four chambers. This causes the muscles to contract in a controlled rhythm, pushing blood from the heart to the lungs and the rest of the body. 
We're treating here at the Bronton very complex patients that have faulty heart rhythms. The heart starts racing suddenly, and sometimes medication doesn't work really well, and we try to find the spot in the heart that makes that heart race. To locate these defective points, the doctor has to insert a catheter or fine tube into the heart, all the way up from the groin. Well, normally, I would take a normal catheter, a conventional catheter, which is one like this, fairly stiff, and I steer from the handle here. That would be a, the normal way of steering this catheter. But we have to go quite a complex way. With a constant risk of puncturing the heart, control is everything. I have a little magnet here to show you. And I can steer and change oh, the direction wow. of the catheter. By using magnets, Dr. Ernst can steer the catheter with much more precision. But for the real operation, she won't be using these magnets. She'll be using these, each weighing over a ton. And I'm going to steer the whole catheter procedure from outside. Dr. Ernst has rigged up a dummy heart, which she uses for training. You could have a go if you want to. You're not serious, are you? No, I'm serious. OK, go ahead. <laughs> OK, so what do I do? So let's try to point up towards the blue. And it's going to follow you right away. Now, I could say, get the catheter tip to this place. Oh, that's too much. I missed it. A little bit more to the side. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> that was easy. I bet you're good at computer games. I'm very good at computer games. I'm, I'm, I always say that this is one of the first training. But today's procedure isn't a game. They'll be performing a potentially life-saving operation on Debbie Statham Britton, who's had problems with her heart since childhood. Well, three weeks ago, I was in work and I was taken unwell. Um, I thought I was just having a slight palpitation, but um, my heart was beating very fast and it was just continuous and it wasn't stopping at all. Debbie was born with the heart's two main arteries the wrong way round. An operation to correct this has left scar tissue, which blocks the heart's electrical signals. New pathways have formed around the scars, which make the electrical impulse travel much faster, causing the heart to race. So what we're going to do is, first of all, get the 3D pictures from the MRI scan so that they sit on top of the X-ray picture. So I get the whole roadmap where I have to go. The catheter is shown as this little icon here, this little colored thing. So I really have to come up the red, turn around in the yellow, and then end up in this area. That's the place where they have to go. Using a reference catheter, which she inserted earlier, Dr. Ernst electrically stimulates Debbie's heart. Initial heart rate was around 50 beats. Now our heart race is in 130 beats. Why do you need to make it race? Because I need to understand exactly which place the arrhythmia takes, which, which course it takes. And once I've understood which area is actually involved, I can then interrupt that. Very likely that this goes in a circuit, and I just need to then break that circuit. Using the magnetic catheter and a 3D mapping program, Dr. Ernst measures the time the electrical signal takes to move from the first reference catheter to a series of locations inside the heart, represented by the red waves on the screen. What's happened now is Dr. Ernst has actually mapped the heart. She's found out where the faulty electrical signal is, and she's now going to burn little bits around the heart to interrupt the faulty electrical signal. So I'm now very, very sure that I know exactly where to burn the inside of Debbie's heart. So I'm going to make a line from here to there. At some point, the ticardia should stop. You can hear the peep. That is the ablation so turned that, on. That's the burning. That that's the burning, sound. exactly. Yeah. So everyone in the room now knows this is a critical part. How many seconds is that? Uh, 95 seconds. Nicola has an eye on the pressure. That's 95 seconds. OK, so it has already slowed down, which is showing the blating her heart at the right place. But we need to make that line complete. What's her cycle length now? 380. Oh, you don't need to pace. Let's just stop pacing. She has a good enough rate. And her heart was racing. We made this line. We interrupted the tachycardia, and it stopped. 
So you've got Debbie's heartbeat to around uh, 60? 68, 69 beats per minute at the moment. So. Um, that's normal. That's absolutely normal. That's her normal rhythm. That's, that's good. That's what we want her to have. Yeah. So that means Debbie's heart problems are now cured once and for all. After three hours, the procedure is over. A conventional manual catheter procedure would have taken almost double the time, and only a minute's worth of X-ray with potentially harmful radiation was used. So how's it going? Oh, good. It's really good. I'm feeling much, much better, thank you. You look much better. Oh, I feel it. <laughs> now, I gather you weren't actually asleep during the operation. You were actually aware of what was going on. Yeah, I was. <laughs> but it was fine. It was OK. I was really surprised. Um, I could feel when, um, when they started my heart beating fast to find the area that they needed. Um, yeah, I could feel... The my heart going much, much faster. And then when they were doing the actual burning of the area, I was aware of the sensation of the burning that they were doing. And um, what difference do you think it's made to you? Oh, it's made a huge difference, to be honest. I didn't realise how unwell I, f I was actually feeling. Um, now I've had it done, I can see how I wasn't right at all. I didn't feel at all well. Um, so it'd be nice to get back to being me. New genetic tests have been developed to help men with prostate cancer decide whether to undergo immediate treatment and risk harmful side effects or to safely monitor the disease. The tests use multiple genes taken from a biopsy to gauge whether the cancer is aggressive enough to be life-threatening. As the Indonesian government rolls out universal health care, hospitals in Jakarta are struggling to cope with an influx of patients, with some doctors saying numbers have more than doubled to 700 a day. The initiative aims to give all 240 million citizens access to free or subsidised healthcare by 2019. The government says reports of overcrowding are exaggerated. Australia is famous for red deserts and wide open spaces, but here in far north Queensland, it's more akin to Southeast Asia or deepest Africa. Here, the jungle closes in tight and brings with it all the problems of the muggy tropics, including swarms of mosquitoes and dengue fever. I'm Tamara Sheward in Cairns, Australia's dengue capital, where scientists are conducting revolutionary field trials that bite back at the dengue mosquito. Transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquito, dengue is a virus that poses a risk to 2.5 billion people worldwide. Also known as breakbone fever, Symptoms include headache, muscle and joint pains, and a skin rash. Today, dengue affects most Asian and Latin American countries and has become a leading cause of hospitalization and death among children in these regions. As recently as 2009, the Cairns region was in the grip of the largest dengue fever epidemic in Australia for over 50 years. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Tamara. How, How are you going? You? Great, great. Nice great. to meet you. I'll show you around. OK, thank you. Lisa O'Mara has a personal interest in seeing the disease eradicated from North Queensland. Lisa was bitten by the dengue-carrying mosquito and fell seriously ill. Yeah. Uh, I was at work and I just had to lie on the floor. Just all of a sudden it was like being hit by a truck. Aches and pains, like in the bones. Oh. I've never had anything like it before. Oh. And it was relentless. It went on and on. Yeah. You know, I really felt like I was going to die at one stage. I just couldn't take the pain. The Aedes aegypti eggs can survive in a tiny amount of water. The eggs can be there for quite a long time and they just need the water to rise up above them. Yeah. And there we go, they hatch out. And this is why it's so difficult here. You've got to keep on to everything, like, mm -hmm. look how much water that collected. We check the yard the whole time now, and I am very paranoid because I think there's four strains around at the moment in Cairns, mm -hmm. and especially in this area. There is no known cure for dengue fever, and global warming is expected to make billions more people at risk of catching the disease. But at James Cook University in Cairns, an Australian-led international project called Eliminate Dengue is working on a new approach. Instead of trying to immunise the human population against the disease, they are using the mosquito's prolific breeding habits to immunise the insects themselves. 
Professor Scott Ritchie leads a team that's breeding a new army of dengue-resistant mosquitoes. Pretend to be a scientist. You betcha. Mm -hmm. Welcome to here. the James Cook University Mosquito Research Facility. Thank you very much. So this is yeah. sort of like a bit of a, a mosquito nursery, isn't yeah, it, here? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. These are actual mosquito eggs that are on these strips here. All these tiny little dots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mosquitoes. that might be uh, 1,500 eggs. I don't envy the person that has to count all of those. Yeah. Professor Ritchie's team inject the eggs with a bacteria called Wolbachia, a parasite found in 70% of other insects. In the 80s Egypti mosquito, the Wolbachia bacteria block the mosquito's ability to carry the dengue virus. So we've got about 500 Wolbachia infected 80s Egypti mosquitoes in here. And then once those things get to this point, then we'll transfer them into cups. So these are, yeah, the fully emerged adult Wolbachia infected mosquitoes. Um, and these are the ones we release. So and there's 50 in each cup. These things are a week old wait, from the time they were there. Look at them. They will bite you. They will. They look like they want <laughs> yeah. to bite me. They're very excited. The newly infected mosquitoes will hand the Wolbachia parasite down to their offspring, making every new generation resistant to carrying the dengue virus. Tomorrow we've got a little special research cage here. Mm. And what we're trying to figure out is how many eggs does the average Wolbachia infected female Aedes aegypti lay? and we want to get actual real human blood like they might feed out the real world. So will you help us out? And, I'd uh, love to. Stick your hand in there and let them, let them feed. And Same you can just sort of set it on the ground and set just... Oh, yeah, OK, and, there's a couple. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's good, I can, man. Yeah, I can feel... Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent, the, excellent. Did you really have specially sharp teeth or something? Yeah, it's like some kind of living acupuncture or something. There's like rows of them, and they're coming and going, and I guess the guys that are just sort of watching are, yeah, the, are the males, they're not biting me. Yeah, the males fly around, and what they really do is they try to intercept the females when they fly in to feed on you. Yeah. Yeah, and, that's, and then they mate. These are our volunteer blood feeders. So they're people, believe it or not, who sit in a cage of mosquitoes and allow the mosquitoes to feed on them. What do you call this little room here? Well, we call it the House of Pain. <laughs> they just sit there and they're happy for these mozzies to bite, bite away. Well, they get $20 for 10 minutes. Uh -huh, Aha, that Otherwise, explains, forget it. That explains you know? everything. Once they fed, these mosquitoes will be released into the suburbs of Cairns to breed, passing on their sexually transmitted Wolbachia parasite and effectively immunizing the next generation of mosquitoes. If these field trials are successful, the Eliminate Dengue team will move this Australian innovation to the front line of dengue riddled countries like Vietnam. So this is it, huh? This is the mosquitoes carrying Wolbachia. Yep, so these are the ones carrying them that we're, today we're gonna go and we're gonna release these ones. These mosquitoes are sexually mature. They're ready to sort of go and get going, get stuck into the dengue, dengue mosquitoes. That's right. So yeah. they're already five days old when we release them. So they're sexually mature and ready to go out and mate the, the wild mosquitoes. Excellent. All right, so. This is number three, so mm -hmm. this is a release house. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Release! Okay. Release! Go forth, multiply. <laughs> Stop dengue fever. Yeah, and that's it. They're on their way. So this is puppy dogs. <laughs>